Good morning. I'm Jessica Warren. I'm the Agriculture and Natural Resources Agent and County Extension Coordinator for the University of Georgia Extension in Camden County. And this morning I'll be talking to you about encouraging biodiversity at home. So this presentation is part of the University of Georgia Extension Services Georgia Green Landscapes Program, which has been funded by the Center for Urban Agriculture. And these series will help uh, Georgia residents create cer certified sustainable Georgia landscapes with the goal of protecting our natural resources for future generations. So to start with, what is biodiversity? So biodiversity literally means the diversity of life. Um, uh, biodiversity is defined as um, biological diversity, the variety of life found in a place on earth, or often the total variety of life on earth. So we may be talking about this on a small scale, like in your landscape or globally. Um, a common measure of this variety is called species ri richness, um, which is a count of the species in an area. Furthermore, biodiversity encompasses the genetic variety within each species and the variety of ecosystems that species can create. So why are we talking about biodiversity? Why do we want biodiversity in our landscapes? Which is what we're gonna be focusing on because this is a landscape program. So um, ecosystems are complex and all life is intertwined, which creates a balance. And a healthy society and a healthy neighborhood or a healthy home, um, requires a healthy planet. So it's important for us to do our part to help uh, support that. A biodiverse landscape is a healthy landscape. Um, a lot of times if we've got more biodiversity in our landscape, we'll be fighting it less um, to have it be successful, which we'll go into a little bit more in a little while about how we often try to fight nature instead of work with it. Um, but the healthier, our, our, we'll have a healthier landscape that's easier to manage when it is more biodiverse. Um, a quote from E.O. Wilson, Edward O. Wilson, who is um, a renowned scientist. He's in his 90s now, and he's kind of a hero in the natural resources world. He's known as the father of biodiversity, the term biodiversity anyway. He coined that. Um, his quote is that biodiversity is the totality of all inherited variation in the life forms of Earth, of which we are just one species. We study and save it to our great benefit. We ignore and degrade it to our great peril. So what are the things that are threatening biodiversity? And this is on a global scale. Some of these may be occurring locally, but a lot of this is a global issue. So the acronym that's used um, for the biggest threats for biodiversity is HIPPO, and these are ranked in the order of impact. So in order, habitat destruction is the single most, single largest threat to biodiversity on planet Earth. Um, this happens on small scales with monocultures in our landscape and development, but um, it also happens in large scales like deforestation in the rainforest. Um, all of this, all habitat destruction impact is important. There are areas that it's worse than others, but it's all important and anywhere that we can mitigate that is gonna be beneficial. Second in ranking is invasive species, which you will see that we have a program specifically on invasive species in this series, and we'll touch on them lightly in a moment here. Pollution, um, which there are a number of different sources of pollution. Today, what we'll look at is pollution primarily that's coming from your landscape or your home um, for ways that you can mitigate that and have an impact and help. Human overpopulation um, is the next in order and over harvesting through hunting and fishing. This probably isn't the hunting and fishing you would be as familiar with locally, um, or you know, uh, this isn't as big of an issue in the US as a lot more globally or on commercial scales, I should say. So overfishing is a big issue globally um, as well as nationally um, and hunting as well, but over harvesting in general of our um, wild resources. So how do we foster biodiversity in our landscapes? So one of the biggest things we can do is creating a diverse landscape by not having monocultures. So a monoculture is anything where you're trying to grow just one species and nothing else. 
So you could have a monoculture of shrubs if the only um, ornamental that you have in your landscape is say boxwoods or some other hedge that's just grown all together and um, there's really nothing else there. Uh, a monoculture is a lawn. Um, if you have a lawn that is just one species of turf grass, that, that in itself is a monoculture. So avoiding as much area, we may not be able to avoid having any small areas of monocultures, but reducing the amount of our landscape that is in a monoculture um, is going to help. We're going to do this through plant species diversity. So the more diverse species that we have in our landscape, the more habitat and resources and ecological balance that we'll provide. With that being said, in that diversity, we don't want any invasive species because they're going to strive to be a monoculture themselves. An invasive species is something that is not native, um, though, as you'll learn in our other presentation, not all non-natives are invasive, but it's something that is, it's a species that is non-native, but that outcompetes um, native uh, species because it has no natural predators. And it's usually very prolific. So it reproduces quickly and a lot and spreads. Um, so it's very hard to control and it will usually take over an, an environment and also a lot of times it can change the ecology of an environment and change the resources that are available to wildlife or insects or microbes in the soil. So um, in our plant species diversity, we're going to focus on natives. Not everything has to be native, but we do want to make sure that anything that's not native is not invasive. We want to learn to accept some imperfections in our landscape, which we'll talk about in a little bit here. But um, imperfections, we're all imperfect, so why can't our landscape be a little imperfect too? Seeing the beauty in what naturally occurs. So we'll go into that a little bit more in a minute, but there's so many wonderful things that naturally occur in our landscapes, especially if we let um, nature have some say and let our natural ecology um, work with us instead of against us. There's some really cool things that we can see in our landscapes. Also providing preserving habitat. So we'll talk about the three main things in that category. So in providing preserving habitat, we want to um, provide or preserve food, water, and shelter and structure. Another thing that we can do um, to help foster, foster biodiversity is reduce and or eliminate our contributions to pollution. Um, and we'll talk about a few things, but primarily we'll focus on trying to either be a minimum pesticide, minimal pesticide or pesticide-free landscape. And this is a very attainable goal, especially if you're focused on having a more biodiverse landscape instead of having a perfect and unrealistic landscape. So the first thing, as we mentioned, was no monocultures. So in nature, there are no monocultures. Um, nature doesn't produce monocultures. What you see in this picture here is clearly a very, uh, is a, con a convention of man because you've never seen this in nature. There may be fields of grass, but there are going to be different species of grass intertwined together um, with some other, you know, wildflowers or things in there. Um, this, this, is, this is our idea of beauty, not nature's. And part of the reason that nature doesn't produce monocultures is because monocultures do not support life. They're devoid of habitat. Um, they're not healthy for usually for the soil or the microbes in the soil, but also they're not healthy for wildlife or insects or, you know, a lot of things. Now, it's not to say, I mean, you can, they can provide a little bit of habitat as far as you will find insects that like to eat your lawn, but um, in general, it's just ecologically pretty devoid of life um, or of habitat to support life. Monocultures put people constantly at war with nature um, in an effort to support natural processes. I see this all the time as an agent on the coast because we have, um, we live in an area that really is not very conducive to turf grass, uh, especially a lot of our county because we don't have good drainage in our soils. Um, we have coastal soils and wetland soils, and it's a constant fight that a lot of people have to have this ideal perfect landscape, especially in some of our higher end developments. Um, and it's just not, it's not sustainable. It's a constant fight. Um, people spend tens of thousands of dollars, many tens of thousands of dollars, constantly either resodding and on pesticides and landscape services and fertilizers and all of these different things to try and control nature. 
but usually still without success because they have constant disease issues or insect pressures or um, well, fungal is disease. We see a lot of fungal issues. And sometimes it's just environmental stress from things staying too wet. So um, a lot of times when we're trying to focus so hard on these monocultures, we're just causing ourselves a lot of undue stress, not to mention the stress we're causing for our natural environment and our landscape. So plant species diversity. Um, the more variety that you have in your plants, um, the better habitat that you're going to provide. So each plant species is going to provide different levels of food and structure and moisture um, and height, uh, shelter to your landscape. So the more um, different species of plants that you can incorporate in, especially of native plants, they're going to provide more breeding grounds, more um, if you're into butterflies and pollinators, um, a lot of them need certain plants that are native that um, are host species for their larvae to develop in order to fulfill their life cycle. Um, they're also going to be more nutritionally rich uh, for a lot of native insects and wildlife. You can see here there's a lot of different diversity. You've got native shrubs with the palmetto. Again, this is coastal. There are other things in other parts of the state. Um, with the monarda and the button bush and the hibiscus, you've got you know different flower structures, different plant structures and height structures in there. Um, the bottom right is a pollinator bed, which is using you know natural wood from trees that have fallen in the area as the border. It's got a lot of different native plants in there that creates different heights, um, vertical structure as well as horizontal structure, different leaf types. Um, so they can, some of those plants are gonna hold or cut moisture or water better than others for insects and wildlife. Um, also providing some shelter and food resources throughout the year because there's a number of plants in there that bloom at different times throughout the year. And then um, another thing is that in the winter when these things die back, a lot of them leave woody stems, which can also be used as habitat, especially for your solitary nesting bees and other insects of that nature. And then we also still want things like trees and as, as well. So we want herbaceous plants, shrubs, trees, as much as diversity, um, not just in different plants, but in different types of plants as we can incorporate, it's gonna be more beneficial. So removing invasive species. This is an important one. Um, so invasive species destroy habitat by displacing the native species. Um, they usually provide little to no food resources or the food resources are not as nutritionally um, diverse to native species and wildlife. Um, they can lead to ecosystem collapse. They can lead to monocultures with no predator pressure. Um, so things like what, what we have pictured here in the upper left is um, Chinese tallow, sometimes known as popcorn tree, which will take over an area and also spreads along waterways. It's easily transported by water. Its seeds are very viable. Um, it's also spread by animals sometimes. And it will, um, we'll see this a lot along, like I said, waterways, rivers, marshes, and it just pushes everything else out and takes over the ecosystem. Um, coral ardesia on the bottom there is um, a big problem in Florida. We have it here in Georgia as well. A lot of people still like to plant this because they think it's pretty. We have native alternatives that have a similar look. Um, but this, you can find pictures in Florida where there are forests where the understory is nothing but coral ardesia as far as you can see. And it has pushed out every other plant species um, or shaded out every other plant species that would naturally be occurring um, in that lower level of the forest ecosystem. Um, of course, anything that's invasive that has berries or fruit of any kind, a lot of times gets consumed by wildlife and then spread to other areas. Um, and one of the things that's really a concern in Georgia is that a lot of our of the invasive species that we struggle with are still sold in the ornamental trade in Georgia. This is because Georgia is one of four states in the United States that does not have a noxious weed list um, or a state noxious weed law. So um, 
Whereas, you know, I live right on the state line. I can go to Home Depot or Lowe's in Florida and they don't sell something because it's illegal in Florida, but I can drive right back across the state line and it's being sold in Georgia just because it's legal to sell there and people will buy it. So being cautious when you do buy um, plants that they're not invasive, you know, trying to, to educate yourself first about what you're putting in your landscape is really important. And also if you find, you know, we all make mistakes. If there's things that you didn't realize were invasive that you planted, or maybe they were in your landscape already from a previous homeowner or that they came over from somewhere else, removing those um, invasive species is, is, a, is a great one of the great best things that you can do to increase biodiversity and help support a healthy landscape. So accepting some imperfections in your landscape. I think this is something that a lot of clients and a lot of our residents struggle with. Um, you know, we're not perfect. Life isn't perfect. Your landscape shouldn't be either. Um, I personally have never minded an imperfect landscape, but a lot of people seem to. Um, this is actually a picture of my lawn because I find it more important to have a pesticide free lawn in the areas that I do have to have grass like over my septic tank. Um, then I think that's more important than having no weeds in my lawn. Um, I look at it as having a biodiverse lawn. I leave some spots that are bare for um, ground nesting bees and other insects to use. Um, and then also I have, you know, different things that grow in the lawn. And I'll be honest, not everybody likes this philosophy, but at my house, if it's green and you mow it, it all looks the same. So um, you can see some dollar weed here. Dollar weed is a constant struggle where we live. I would have to do multiple um, herbicide applications a year to try and keep the dollar weed away, not to mention some of the other weeds. And to me, it's not that important. I would rather focus on um, having good habitat, having good pollinator areas for my pollinators and good habitat for the wildlife that's around me. Um, and also just not, not putting that extra pollution out there because is it, it's not really necessary. This doesn't hurt my life quality and it helps improve the life quality of other organisms that I share my landscape with. So letting go of those unrealistic expectations because you're never gonna have consistently without spending a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of pollution, you're never gonna have a perfect manicured lawn. It's outside, that's not a controlled environment and you can't control nature. So it's gonna be a constant fight. Sometimes it helps for people to think about the consequences of striving for that landscape perfection, of what the cost of that really is. And I think a lot of times we don't step back and think about that. So first, the first cost is actually cost. So you can spend a lot of money over the years, and especially if you start multiplying that out and thinking about how much you're spending every year on fertilizers, on um, maybe lime, depending on where you live, um, on, pest, on insecticides, on fungicides, on herbicides, trying to keep weeds out, trying to keep insects out, um, trying to keep disease out. Not to mention if you're somewhere where you're irrigating, um, and what all those costs add up to for your wallet um, and what you could be spending that on otherwise, like taking a nice trip with someone you love or having a cool experience. Um, another thing is the pollution that comes off of that. So, um, you know, pollution is something we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute, but as little as a teaspoon of certain pesticides that rin get rinsed down a drain um, is enough to show up as a pollutant in local streams. And that was something that um, was found through research at Colorado State University Extension. So, you know, thinking about what you're putting out there and where it ends up. So it's not just staying in your lawn, the rain washes it um, potentially down the storm drains or with your storm drains, that water is not treated in most places. It just goes straight out to a natural waterway. And even if you don't have storm drains, it may still rinse into a wetland, that would be the case at my house, or um, a creek nearby, or even just a puddle that um, wildlife or other organisms are using as a water source. So thinking about the impacts of your actions, um, also how it can change the soil chemistry over time and affect other plants maybe you didn't intend to affect. Um, another thing is time. People spend a lot of time um, working on having a perfect landscape. And, you know, one thing I think about is on my deathbed, would I, am I going to remember 
that, you know, special afternoon I spent hiking with a loved one? Or am I going to remember, man, my lawn never had any weeds in it. <laughs> so thinking about the time that you're giving to that and your life energy, because you can't get that back and life is short. So what do you want to put time in and is it offering enough benefit to you? Also stress. I have a lot of clients that are super stressed out all the time about their lawn, even after they've spent tens of thousands of dollars on it and tons of time, but it's still never quite what they want it to be. And that's a lot of undue stress. I think, um, especially after 2020 has hit, we realize that there's a lot of stressors that we can't control. So choose the ones that you can control carefully. <laughs> Another thing is ecological damage. Um, I think we've touched on this a little bit already with things like pollution, but um, trying, striving to constantly for a perfect landscape is going to damage the ecology, not just through things like pollution, but also through um, loss of ecosystem balance and through species loss and through not providing habitat for things that naturally occur there. So just a few things to think about. So this is something I always try to encourage my clients to do is to see the beauty in what naturally occurs. Uh, every year I'll have a handful of people who call me and they want something they can spray on Spanish moss. They move to the coast, but they hate Spanish moss and it's on all their trees and they need to get rid of it. In which I tell them that you move to this area for a reason and that is part of our ecosystem here. Um, it's not a pest, it doesn't do any harm. We don't need to get rid of it. I think you should embrace where you live and the, what's naturally occurring around you. Um, see the beauty and what's there. Um, so this is easier for some people than others, or and it may be easier for you with some things than others. So here um, on this slide, these are all things I took, pictures I took in my landscape at my house. So in the upper right hand corner there, you can see bark lice on a tree. Um, it looks like the, the trees were in pantyhose. I get questions about these every year. They don't do any harm to the tree. They're just eating, um, helping, uh, de eating some decomposing bark material that's on the trunk. But they're really fascinating. And it's kind of this cool landscape oddity. So I was excited to see that out in my landscape. Um, we also, you know, we're in kind of a wetland area. So we have tons of frogs and lizards which help with the bugs. So I'm very happy to see them. Plus they're just a lot of fun to watch. And what is cuter than a little tree frog? Um, so we've got lots of those. We've also got spiders, which I know freak some people out. They've never bothered me. I love seeing all the different species of spiders that we have. Some of them are super colorful and funky looking and they're helping with those mosquitoes and things I don't really wanna deal with too much either. So I'm glad they're there to help keep things in balance. Um, one of the things that might be easier for people to appreciate is this beautiful metallic bee um, on the bottom left down here. Um, I love seeing all the different, uh, the diversity of pollinators that I get because I'm not spraying anything. Um, I get lots of beneficial insects. So, you know, in, insects are beneficial or not basically according to our opinion on them, but I love seeing the beneficial insects that we get, um, different pollinators and other beneficials as well. And we have a very live and let live policy at our house. Um, also up here, I love seeing our resident garter snake. Um, this guy or girl, I haven't checked, um, loves to hang out in our gardens and in our shed. And, you know, I'll see him sometimes out in the yard. And he's just help, helping, helping keep some populations in control there and is obviously pretty well fed and always a, a cool thing to see. Um, less popular to most people, but not a problem at our house is this little pygmy rattlesnake that you see. This is a dusky pygmy that we have pretty commonly along the coast. These guys are not aggressive, um, you know, unless you step on one. But honestly, they're so small and they are so cryptic, so so well camouflaged that often you step right over them and you don't even know they're there, which I guess makes some people panic to know. But um, they don't want to bite you, you know, unless they have no choice, no last resort to escape or defend themselves. So um, I like seeing these little guys. They're really pretty and they're just out there moving through the leaf litter and stuff and trying to trying to find their next meal. I also love, especially with all the rains that we get, all the beautiful variety of different mushrooms that we have pop up different times of the year um, and wildflowers, which aren't on here, but we have, you know, a lot of those things that cycle with the seasonality. So it's really interesting um, if you spend some more time outside and you kind of 
you know, have some more natural areas in your landscape, all the things that you see that you might not would see otherwise and finding the good in those and the benefit that they offer to you and your landscape. All right, so we talked about um, providing habitat for, to help support biodiversity. So the first part of that that we'll talk about is food. So, um, you know, as you're probably aware, insects are the base of the food web. Um, so it's important that we do want some insects around. You know, as we talked about, some are beneficial and some are not as beneficial. Some are more pests. Um, though some of the things that may be pests when they're, say, a caterpillar or in a larvae form, we find beneficial when they reach their adult form. So that's something to consider as well. We are experiencing um, a record global insect loss. Some people are terming it an insect apocalypse which doesn't seem like a big, be big deal to most people till you think about how that's the base of the entire food web and how dependent we really are upon insects, um, both to feed things that we like to eat and in some countries to be a food source, but also for services like pollination. Um, so this is resulting, this insect apocalypse is resulting in um, bird and other animal loss. And if left unchecked, it could lead to total ecosystem collapse, um, which, we should definitely care about because it'll definitely impact us in a very major way. Um, it's also affecting our food production and pollination. Uh, you can see that National Geographic actually recently thought this was such a big deal that it moved their cover story. Uh, so insects, if we're trying to provide for more insects in our landscape, we want shelter and water and food, which is, you know, the same thing that most organisms are going to need. As far as food goes, plants, other insects, decomposing natural materials, pesticide-free habitats. One important thing to keep in mind with pesticides is that a lot of times you're not just killing what you're trying to kill. Um, you're going to have non-target kills as well. So being really careful with those, and if you do have to use any insecticides in the landscape, trying to use something that is not broad spectrum. So something that's more specific to a certain species or a certain um, family of insects. So, and being careful how you put that out as well, so that you're not having, you're not killing off a lot of things that weren't your intended target. So water, um, having a water source around is important for most organisms. Um, this could be, you know, something like a bird bath, but it can also be something as simple as areas that you let puddle. Um, old plate, shallow dishes, things like that. Now, of course, with any water source, you're going, if you're maintaining a water source, you're going to want to um, tip that out and wash it out regularly and put clean water in so that we don't have things like a mosquito breeding ground or um, something where a lot of diseases are starting to grow because it's not, you know, getting, getting moved around or moved out. Um, you can also add rocks or marbles um, to either a bird bath or a dish, you know, to, to allow insects to access some water without drowning. Incorporating plants that have some cupped leaves into your landscape is a simple way, um, a very passive way. They'll hold some water temporarily. Also, rocks or pavers that have slight depressions in them. Um, those can act as a water source as well. So it doesn't have to be something that you have to constantly actively maintain. It can just be a few simple things that you incorporate into your landscape um, that allow um, some water sources for wildlife, including insects. Another thing too is having um, some bare spots in your soil as well, because things like butterflies a lot of times like to get their moisture um, through their proboscis and things like moist soil. So shelter and structure are important. Um, you know, just like us, most, most wild things are going to need um, some kind of shelter um, for safety, to hide from predators, but also to keep warm or protect from um, the weather extremes. So having different types of structure in your landscape is going to be helpful. So we talked before about this pollinator bed and how it has different, um, it has a lot of vertical structure, different heights, different leaf types, um, woody stems, things like that that incorporate um, shelter and structure, as well as the logs themselves. Some simple things you can do um, that are more passive are leaving the leaves. This is a really big important one, and I think there's starting to be more traction behind this. 
but leaving the leaves. And if you can't leave them on your lawn or wherever they may fall, raking them into an area where you can leave them. So for um, a lot of organisms, especially insects and microbes and um, some small snakes and lizards and frogs, um, and also things like some butterflies and moths, they need those leaves for overwintering um, or to complete their life cycle. Um, so without, you know, if you're, you're cleaning your um, landscape and making it devoid of leaves, you're gonna lose a lot of organisms or kill a lot of organisms that way. So having some, some leaf piles or just areas that are just natural where the leaves fall and you let them stay there. This is also great fertilization for your plants and your trees is that natural decomposition of plant matter where it falls. Um, usually if you're doing this, I mean, it, you're mimicking a forest ecosystem. You don't go in and fertilize the forest. So you wouldn't need to fertilize these areas because those nutrients are staying in the cycle. You're not pulling them out. Uh, another thing that's simple that you can do is um, log piles or rock piles. We don't have a lot of rocks in our area naturally, so rock piles are a little less common, but that can provide shelter and structure. Log piles are great. Um, not only do they provide shelter in an obvious way, but also in the wintertime, they're going to provide more heat because as they start to break down and decompose, they actually release heat. So um, that's going to be a warmer place for a lot of wildlife, small wildlife and insects um, to overwinter at. Also, if you have the option safely, um, leaving snags. So a snag, and this is this picture's a little blurry because it's from such a distance, but a snag is a dead tree that hasn't fallen. Um, you can see that this, pit, this tree is completely dead. A snag is a great habitat for tons of different wildlife, um, from birds to mammals, all sorts of things, insects, all kinds of things. So if you have it in a safe place where it does not pose a hazard to a home or um, a road or somebody, you know, if it's in a safe place, it's a little distance, or if maybe part of it's broken off and it's not very tall and it's not, there's not much to fall, leaving those snags is great wildlife habitat and a great um, key to fostering biodiversity in your landscape. Some things that are um, not as naturally occurring, but still good is you can institute bird houses, bat houses, um, you know, mason bee houses. Just make sure if you're integrating those things that they're built appropriately, they're not using any toxic materials, and that you're cleaning them out or changing them out um, appropriately as well so that you're not creating an area that can foster um, disease or, you know, predators or, you know, that you're not hurting more than you're helping. All right, so now we can talk a little bit about reducing um, or eliminating your contributions to pollution. So there's a number of things this can come from in the home landscape. Pet waste is one of them. Um, I love my dogs, but it, I do realize that their um, feces can be an issue. Um, a single gram of pet waste contains an average of 23 million fecal coliform bacteria. Um, so, you know, maybe you don't you don't want that in your landscape hanging around anyway, especially if you have children playing in the yard. Um, but also that's a lot that can wash easily wash into um, local streams or rivers or wetlands um, or puddles that other things are drinking out of. Um, cats are the same way. Um, in fact, uh, to me, I think outdoor cats are much worse and um, you know, any any wildlife or natural resources professional will strongly encourage you or anyone who works on invasive species will strongly encourage you to consider keeping your cats indoors unless you're walking them on a leash because they are so destructive and harmful to native wildlife, as well as to the ecosystem through things like the spread of disease. It's very easy for them to um, spray it, spread toxoplasmosis to humans, which can cause um, mental health issues along with other things. Um, and the thing that always worries me about outdoor cats is that they travel so far, you don't really know where they are, but also a lot of times they like to put their waste in your vegetable beds. Um, anything that's some loose soil, they love to bury their feces in, um, which is definitely not where I want disease ridden poop at is in my garden, my vegetable garden. <laughs> but um, so, you know, dog and cat waste, 
dispose of that properly. Um, ideally, cats should stay indoors and be using a litter box and with dogs picking up after your pet, even in the home landscape. And that really needs to go into the garbage. Um, unless you have a, a set up system for burying it appropriately, but really it needs to go into the garbage. Um, it's not supposed to go down the toilet either. So fertilizer runoff is a, another um, big contributor to pollution in the home landscape. So, you know, a lot of people um, with fertilizers or pesticides, they don't realize how much runoff may be actually happening, especially if there's a rain after they apply. Um, also, a lot of times I'll have folks that, you know, a little is good, more must be better, which is not the case. So over applying is another way to have excessive runoff. Um, fertilizer runoff can cause algae blooms and weed blooms in um, native water bodies, which can cause fish kills and other issues. Um, and then also with pesticide use, especially if you're using something that's not aquatically approved and it ends up in an aquatic environment, it can kill a lot of things. So, you know, avoiding those things when you can, making sure that if you're using them, you really need to. Um, if you've got an issue in your landscape, talk to your local extension agent, share it, send them some pictures of what you're seeing um, and get them to diagnose it correctly first before you just start throwing things at it that when you're not sure what's really going on. And then also, if you do have to use um, pesticides or you're using fertilizer, please, with pesticides, please follow the label. And with fertilizer, please follow the rates and directions um, recommended. With fertilizer, the best thing to do before you spend money on fertilizer and time is get a soil test each year. Um, you can do this through your local extension office. It's $6 plus whatever shipping, you know, that local office has to charge in order to get it to Athens. Um, but they'll send you recommendations of what you actually need, if you need anything, and you may not. So applying fertilizer only when needed, um, avoiding pesticides when possible, and if you are using them, make sure you're using them correctly and according to the label, and, um, you know, using them when needed, but not beyond that. Um, cleaning chemicals are another one you know, being cautious with those, especially if you're using them outdoors, washing your house off or using them maybe on your car or something else. Um, oil, fuel spills, leaks, exhaust, all those things contribute to pollution, you know, making sure that you keep your car well maintained if possible and with no oil leaks or, you know, other kinds of leaks that may contribute. Trash, trying to reduce the amount that you consume and especially of one-time use products. Um, recycling and composting were available and you can find we have another presentation and video on composting. Um, so ways to just kind of re reduce our impact helps with biodiversity both in our landscape and on a larger scale. So a little bit that um, I've, I've put in here and that you can find in a, the PDFs of our presentations on the website. Um, just a few articles that um, and websites on biodiversity and related issues. Also some books, if this is something that interests you and you really like to read more. Most of these are nonfiction. There is one fiction book at the bottom that has a lot of um, ecology in it. It's um, not for mixed audiences, though, I will say that. But there's some, some really um, good explanations and in-depth um, resources here about biodiversity and how it matters. So I'll leave you with this before we go over our certification standards. I thought this was kind of appropriate for this presentation since this presentation is a little different than most of ours, but it's a quote from the Lorax, if you're familiar with Dr. Seuss. Um, Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. So our certification checklist items for biodiversity in the home landscape um, is to incorporate diverse plant species in your landscape, reduce monoculture coverage, such as expansive turf lawns and remove invasive species. Another checklist item is to provide and preserve habitat um, with food, water, and shelter for a variety of wildlife, including insects. Reduce or eliminate your contributions to pollution, including a pesticide-free landscape. Prevent pollution and improper disposal of fertilizer, pesticides, cleaning chemicals, pet waste, and oil slash fuel. Pick up trash and reduce consumption and reliance on one-time use products. 
Keep a portion of your landscape naturally diverse and accept landscape imperfections. This means less labor and gives you more time to relax and enjoy your other efforts. So as you may be aware on our metric for our um, Georgia Green Landscape Steward Certification Program, you don't have to check off all the items. You just have to reach a certain point minimum in order to achieve certification for your landscape. But these are some things to consider. And if you have any questions or um, anything else, feel free to email us at georgiagreen at uga.edu or also a lot of information may be able, you may be able to find on our website, which you can find below at site.extension.uga.edu forward slash Georgia Green. Thank you.